Okay, our guest speaker tonight graduated in 2000 from Southern Methodist University with a BA and BS in journalism and public policy. She was a former high school athlete. She originally wanted to be a school teacher, but pursued a career in sports broadcasting after repeated comments of talks too much from teachers and family members. She's a broadcast journalist, reporter and producer for FSN Northwest. She's a high school football official. She's the organizer organist at her church and teaches piano lessons once a week. She makes an amazing rum cake. <laughs> then spoke here at Centralia College in Jeff's Speech Communications 110 class on April 18, 2011. She currently is on the board of directors of Bellevue Boys and Girls Club. She's a professional speaker and business communicator at Expert Talker. And she's Seahawks sideline reporter at Cairo Radio. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jen Mueller. I think that from now on, I'm going to require two introductions anytime I speak. <laughs> Do you know how cool it is when you hear about yourself twice, not just once? Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me here. Um, I just got my voice back. I, for the first time in my life, lost my voice last week. And I cannot tell you what kind of panic that ensued in me and how much my husband appreciated that. So I apologize if I start coughing during the middle. I think I've, I think I've kicked it all, but it still kind of lingers a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got a lot of ground to cover today, and we're gonna start with a couple of problems. Because John Nordstrom had a problem about 40 years ago. And for that matter, the Seattle Seahawks had a problem on Sunday. Anybody watch the game? Any Seahawks fans? Yeah, the problem was pretty evident in the Seahawks game. We'll get back to John in just a minute. It, and you'll notice that actually both John and the Seahawks solved their problem the same way. You see, the Seahawks on Sunday, if you were watching the first two drives, the Washington Redskins drive down the field doing whatever they want to. They score two touchdowns. And here's the number that stuck out to me after the game. 62 yards rushing allowed on the first two drives. Now, our defense only allows about 100 yards a game. So if you take a look at what was done in the first few minutes of the game and you start extrapolating that over four quarters, you were in for big trouble, right? Except that after those two drives, the sideline changed just a little bit. And it got louder on the sideline. And it wasn't because of the fans. Anybody in here ever play high school football or like peewee football or been to a football game? Right? And there's a point in time, particularly in high school, where you are trying to help your teammates out. And if you listen really closely, you will hear everybody on the sideline yelling, pass, 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 run, run, run. What do they do that for? It's communication, right? to help so that the team knows what's going on. Well, the Seahawks were having a hard time figuring out what in the world RG3 was gonna do. And all of a sudden, and I've never heard this before, and I'm on their sidelines every single week. Did you hear the entire team yelling, pass, 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 run, 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 to try to alert their guys on the field as to what was going on? And then there was a lot of different things that happened. There was adjustments that were made. It was them settling down. It was them playing at the right speed. But I can't discount how communication helped change the course of that game early on. Communication helped change the course of Nordstrom department stores early on, too, as we get back to the problem that John Nordstrom had. You see, John Nordstrom's problem was he could not figure out what his winning strategy was going to be when it came to differentiating Nordstrom from all the different department stores that were out there. Now, John Nordstrom used to own the Seahawks, so there's your Seahawks tie, but John also is the one, along with his brother and his cousin, who really elevated Nordstrom to the status that it has today. And he's the one that determined how they were going to treat their customers. And here's how he did it. He spent six months kind of scouting the competition just to see what everybody else was doing, just to come up with this winning game plan. And he came to the conclusion after six months that there was three ways that you know, they just weren't going to be able to compete. They were not going to build bigger buildings and better buildings. That's what everybody else was trying to do. They were trying to go for the glamour stuff, right? He said, this is not a productive way to run a business. We're not doing that. He said, you know, the other thing that we're not going to do is continue to lower the prices and make them lower, lower, and lower because I'm trying to be profitable and I'm trying to stay in business. We're not going to do that. 
And the third thing he decided he was not going to do was change the merchandise around. Because how many different kinds of sweaters could you possibly offer to get somebody to shop at Nordstrom versus any of the other department stores? But the one thing he did determine that nobody did very well was take care of the customer. And after that six month period, he went back and the management team gathered all of the employees and they said this, we want you to do whatever it takes to make the customer happy. Just make the customer happy. We don't want them to stand in line and, and have to jump through hoops to return things. We don't want them to feel uncomfortable shopping at our stores. We want the customer to be happy. Now, I love this story, and I use it a lot. You might have heard it before if you've heard me speak previously. Here's the two things that I want to point out about John Nordstrom and how he used communication to be successful. Number one, it was a really simple directive. And at the time, it was innovative. Who would have thought that taking care of the customers and putting the customers first was an innovative strategy? But it was. And it was so simple. And the second thing that I want to call to your attention about that story is that although he gave the directive to every employee in that building and in that group, it's the one-on-one -on -one communication that you have with Nordstrom employees when you go into the department store that keeps you coming back for more. It's the reason that I shop at Nordstrom, right? Because I know that the salesperson who comes to help me will ask how my day is, do I need any help finding anything? And then the ladies in the room know this, I don't know if the guys do, but they take you back, they put your clothes in there, they say, hi, my name's Victoria, what's your name if I can get you any more sizes, right? They go through this whole thing. It's very helpful. And I keep going back. And it's because one person takes the time to talk to me. And in business, sometimes we think that when it, you, when it comes to the workplace communication, when it comes to being a good communicator, it's only when you're talking to groups of people. It's only when you call your team together. It's only when you've got the managers in the room. It's only when you're giving directive. But it's actually the one-on-one -on -one conversations that make the most difference. It's hard to put a value on what a conversation does. The value in the Seahawks game to having better communication was it changed momentum, swung it back to the Seahawks' favor, and resulted in a win, and this week a trip to Atlanta. The value of communication for John Nordstrom was building a brand and making more money and having more business opportunities in the end. Here's one of the ways that you can look at the value of a conversation. And it's through a survey that was done by the American, Psy American Psychiatric uh, Association. I almost said earlier this year. I'm going to have to get used to the 2013. It was early in 2012. And they were doing a survey of employees around the United States. And the question that they really wanted to know is how much more production do you get from people who feel valued as compared to people who don't feel valued at work. And here's the numbers they came up with. For employees who said they feel valued at work, 93% of them said they give their best effort. It's a pretty good number. 88% of those who felt valued at work said that they were more engaged. So they actually paid attention. You know, they, they interacted in meetings. They talked to their coworkers, right? They wanted to do more. They wanted to be a part of that. Those numbers are pretty good. Now let's look at the alternative. For employees who said they did not feel valued at work, only 33% gave their best effort. And only 38% reported being engaged. I am not a math person. This is why I'm a journalist, but I can tell you that your return on investment in that situation is 60%, right? People who feel valued are at 93%, they give their best effort, and then you have 33%. And when they went on and, and they asked, well, what would happen, what would need to happen to make you feel more valued? And people gave all the answers that you would normally think of, right? Well, if I had more vacation days. If I could have a more flexible schedule and if I could work at home, if you gave me a raise, I would certainly feel more valued, right? And all of those are certainly legitimate. 
And maybe at some point in time, you will be in a position to address those concerns. But I would argue that one of the best ways to make people feel valued is to talk to them. You can add value to somebody just by engaging them in a conversation. Because when it, it is apparent that you have an interest in your coworkers and colleagues, they want to be around you. And the way that you communicate with them directly impacts the way your coworkers deal with you and the way they perceive you and the way they work with you. And when you are talking about running a business or being successful in your career, you need people to work well with you. Because you can't always choose the employees or the coworkers that you have. <clears throat> but you can choose how well you want to work with those people. And it takes everybody working together to be productive. And when you are productive together, that's where your opportunities come from. Because I guarantee you, if you have a group of people who really works well, let's take, a, let's take the Seahawks, right? You've got all these people who are working together as a team. You don't think they don't get results? Who's talking about the Seahawks right now? Everybody in the country, right? Who's getting opportunities as a result of the Seahawks wins? Their assistant coaches who are now being looked at for head coaching jobs. Everybody in the organization that had anything to do with putting this team together is getting looked at for more opportunities. Same thing that happens with you when you take the time to build those relationships. Now this is a little bit different of a presentation than I normally give. So I'm going to try to bang through some stuff here really quick. I do want to draw a tie to what Jeff, I think, talked about last week. Did you use the Roger Maris quote? Did you, did you end up using that one? Oh, OK. Well, there was a quote in there that I was reading, some of the notes, talking about how you don't hit home runs by luck, it's preparation. And I was going to tie that into Cal Ripken Jr., who's a baseball fan, Cal Ripken Jr. What is Cal Ripken Jr. known for? Iron Man, right? He played, and I just had to look this up because I have lost track of all of the games that he played, 2,632 consecutive games. And I heard him talk last year, and here was the thing that stood out to me. You know, 2,632 games is amazing. Not only that he was healthy that long, it's amazing he never got benched. Because if you don't perform, you get benched. And there is nobody who performs consistently for more than 2,600 games. Except that he said, you know what? I made sure that I could contribute both offensively and defensively. And he was good at both. Because he had to give the manager a reason to keep him in the game. Because his streak and what he was really trying to go for depended on him being in the game every single day. And he couldn't rely on what he had done yesterday or what his impact could be in the future and how much upside he had. He had to come up with something every day. Communication skills are your way to stay in the game. It is not just about doing the job that you have been assigned to do. It's about making yourself visible. It's about making sure that you can be your own advocate. And you don't even have to talk about how great you are. It's just the way that you talk when you're with other people. And it's being able to get your ideas across. So the people know that you're a rock star in the group. Because just putting your head down and kind of thinking that your work is going to speak for itself, it's not going to get you the same opportunities as if you do the talking yourself. OK. So in the effort of getting through a lot of stuff, and then I'll open it up for questions. We're going to go through five, five steps. One of the reasons that I started coming up with these conversation and communication step-by-step -step how-tos is that I have read a lot of business books. And I love reading business books, particularly business books on communication. Love it, except that they are all missing one very important element of communication, and that is how to communicate. If you read a business book that says communication is great for business, I guarantee you they will show studies about how much more productive you will be if you have relationships with your coworkers and you have communication. Except they don't tell you how to have the conversation. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna go through five things, how to have the conversation and how to be more effective while you're having the conversation. And I know that some of you might not have this love of talking like I do. Nod your heads if you do, don't. Did you get talks too much on your report card? 
Okay, then we are right here on the same wavelength. But if you don't, there's going to be a time when you need to get to know people that you don't know. I do this at the beginning of every single season. Okay, it's building rapport with people you don't know, and it's scary. You get put into a new office. You get put into a new classroom, right? So here's what you're going to do. You're going to be seen, be polite, and be direct. And let me explain. Part of building rapport has nothing to do with what you say. It's just letting people know that you're there. I spend hours standing at practices every week. Do I understand what they're doing at all the practices? No. I do not understand why the same drill is going on the same time with the guy's hand tied behind his back and then rolling on the ground. I don't understand the purpose of it. But I guarantee you when they see me standing out there, those guys recognize I'm in there with them. Right? They just need to get used to seeing me around. Seahawks in particular. There's a lot of people at the beginning of a season. They just need to see that I have become a friendly face after a few days. And after a couple of weeks, they feel a little bit better about talking to me. Being polite just means saying that one line that normal people would say if you walked into a room full of people. Hey, how's your day going? Hey, good to see ya. Can you believe the game yesterday? two days ago, but you get the idea, right? Just nice little chit chat, being polite, having a smile on your face, looking like you're approachable. And being direct is this, when you get to the point where you know the names of the people that you're around, and I do this with the athletes all the time. Athletes are just numbers to a lot of people, or numbers and last names. And you get to the point when they can walk off the field and I say, hey Brandon, good to see you today. Their heads whip around like you would not believe. I don't think anybody notices them. And if a professional athlete doesn't think that people notice them and know their first names, how do you think the people around you feel? They'll notice when you call them by their first name, right? And you will automatically have some rapport with them. When you go to have that conversation, we're moving on to step number two. When you go to have that conversation, don't get ahead of yourself. I tell people this all the time. I always know how interviews start. I never know how they're going to finish. I can have an idea in general about what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this player. I want to talk about this game. Or I want to talk about what it was like on the sideline at that moment in time. But if you get too far down the road in the conversation, and I have, let's say, Richard Sherman, one of our Seahawks, Right? Talking about this play, and I'm already thinking about the third question I'm going to answer. I'm not really doing anything to build rapport, or build a relationship, because it's not about him and what he's saying. I'm thinking about me. I'm thinking about how to make this easier on me. I'm not listening. I'm not tuned in. I'm not zoned into what he's saying. And sometimes when you have conversations with people that are not your best friends, and they're not people that you hang out with all the time, it's easy to think, you know what, I'm going to make it really easy on myself. We're just going to script this out. We're just going to follow the script, and it's going to be great. Except that it always falls short with relationship building, and you leave a lot of information out there. Conversation should be about relationship building and information gathering. Even if that information gathering is just coming up with some personal information you can use in a follow-up conversation. It doesn't have to be about business. It doesn't have to be about your class assignments. Okay, so don't get ahead of yourself in the conversation. As you're having the conversation and as you're formulating the questions that you're going to ask, there are some key assumptions that you should avoid. And I know the word assumptions, you know what it does, ask you, me, all that good stuff, right? But here's some of the key assumptions that I don't even think people realize that they make. And the first one is assuming that everybody's on the same page. And the second one is assuming that your coworkers and everybody can read your mind. Think back to the story about John Nordstrom. Say that John had spent six months doing all of this research and he had come up with a plan. And the plan at the end is really simple, right? And if you'd followed John's train of thought and if you had been with him through the six months and gone with him shopping and heard his experiences, when John comes into the staff meeting, he says, guess what? We're going to do the greatest thing ever. And that great thing is going to be. And everybody in the room looks at him and goes, I have no idea. 
And if he wanted people to come up with the answer on the, uh, their own, but they weren't following his train of thought and hadn't been in his shoes, right, and wasn't on the same page, they would have spent a lot of time trying to come up with a very simple answer. When we get wrapped up in conversations, especially conversations we don't want to have, you formulate all of these things in your head, right? The assumption how somebody is going to answer, what they're feeling. You have had a lot more time to deal with the questions than they have. Okay, so make sure that you are not um, putting words or thoughts into their mouth that they haven't already had. <clears throat> Number four, when you get to a point where you get stuck, so these are the last two things. <clears throat> Use what you don't know to your advantage. And this is a really big thing that people get stuck on all the time. They think that they don't have all the answers. Here's the thing, nobody has all the answers. There's always unknowns. But there's a way that you can make sure that you get information even when you don't think you have any. Think about a breaking news incident, right? We do this all the time in TV and radio. So let's say this. Um, so everybody's watched breaking news, right? There's somebody that comes on, they say, there's just been an accident at 405 and I-90 going eastbound. Uh, we don't know how many cars are involved. We don't know how many people are impacted, but we'll bring you the latest as soon as the chopper is in the air. I have been in newsrooms where that's the only information you have and they will talk for 30 minutes. And all they have is one piece of information. We know that there's an accident at 405 and 90. And what they'll do is keep going back to what they know and what they don't know. So if you find yourself in a situation where you don't have all the answers, the first thing you're going to do is take an inventory, just like a news anchor would. Here's what we know. We know that the accidents happened. We don't know how many cars, how many people, or when emergency crews will get on the way. And then, in a few minutes, they'll say, oh, you know, we have the accident at 405 and 90. We now know that three cars were involved. We're still waiting to see how many people are impacted and when emergency crews are going to get there. And if you listen, they'll keep updating the information. They'll tell you what they know and what they don't know. They will also frame it in a very authoritative way. And what they don't know, they'll tell you they don't know. We don't know what the detour is. We don't know what the traffic backup is. But we'll bring you that information just as soon as we have it. And they will make sure um, they will have the common sense assumptions that go with it, right? And so if the accident at 405 and 90 happened and it's 430, what's the common sense assumption that goes with an accident on a major freeway at 430 in the afternoon? Bad traffic because you got rush hour coming up, right? So here's how this works for you. And we're just going to pick like a... A general conversation. Let's say somebody asks you about a lunch spot. Oh, better yet, let's go dinner. Dinner spot in downtown Seattle. And they think that they want to go to a sushi restaurant called Japanessa. It's right down by the ballpark and right by the art museum. And they say, hey, what do you know about that sushi restaurant called Japanessa? And you kind of freeze for a second, because first of all, you don't like sushi. And second of all, you've never been there. Okay, but you want to have the conversation because the person who just asked you is actually your manager. And he is looking for a recommendation for dinner. And it would really behoove you to have an answer to give him so that you can put yourself in a good light, right? So that he can have this nice conversation with you. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to say, you know what? I don't know much about Japanessa. I haven't eaten there. My favorite types of restaurants are actually Thai. And I have had some great Thai food that's just up the street a little bit um, from the Seattle Center. So I would be happy to give you that recommendation. So see what we've done there? I've identified what you don't know, what you do know. And here's the common sense assumption that would work during dinner time. I also know that there's a ball game going on that night. So traffic might be kind of tough around the ballpark. So what you've just done is turned a negative into a positive because you had a way to answer the questions, paint yourself in a really good light, and the next time your manager might need to take somebody out, let's say you're on a sales call. Who do you think he or she thinks of first? 
person who can have the conversation about something other than business. Okay? The last thing we're going to do is come up with an exit strategy. And it's kind of like knowing, uh, it's kind of like what we just talked about, but this is your chance to really shine and really put yourself in a place where people talk to you about what you want to talk about. And I come back to sports on this one, so bear with me. Do we have, we have sports fans in here. Most everybody in the room is a sports fan. Is there anybody not a sports fan? Okay, that's okay. That's okay. <clears throat> this works. <coughs> nope, this works. This works. Okay, so here's, there's two exit strategies that we're going to employ. And the first one is two words that will get you out of any situation possible. And those words are no, but. Okay, and there's a reason that there's two words there. We want the conversation to continue, and we want to be honest. So here's how it works in the game. So say somebody came up to, and I'm going to pick on you because you just raised your hand and said that you're not a sports fan. Give me your name. Katie. So somebody come, I come up to Katie and I say, Katie, oh my gosh, did you see the Seahawks game on Sunday? <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> Excellent. Katie, without prompting, if you didn't hear, no, but I did something else, right? If somebody asks you a question that you do not have an answer to, do not lie and tell them that you have the answer. If you did not see the game, do not tell people that you saw the game, right? No, I didn't see the game. But... She could have said, but what did you see? But what did you think? I like her answer. No, but I did something else. Now Katie and I are talking. Katie, what did you do? <laughs> I put Katie on the spot, and Katie has lost her train of thought. Right? The point being, if you're trying to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody at work, and you feel like you're stumped, and you feel like you're backed up in a corner, there are ways to get out of it. Right? People don't expect you to do everything the same thing that they do. They shouldn't. And it's great that Katie has other options and other things that she likes to do outside of sports. Because if the purpose of a conversation is relationship building and information, that's a pretty key piece of information that I can use later on to ask her about, provided she remembered what it was. Right? And when you ask her about it, guess what it does? It adds value. Now Katie likes me a little bit more. Now we work together a little bit better. Now we have more productivity. Now we have more opportunities. You see where this is going? It's like a snowball going downhill, okay? Here's the second exit strategy, and it's defining your area of expertise. This happens all the time, and you probably do this without thinking. It's only in those moments where sheer panic sets in, where you go, I have no answer for this at all. People do this to me all the time. I constantly get asked about sporting events that happened before I was born which makes for really awkward opportunities. Or Seattle sports events that happened before I moved here. For example, the Mariners in 1995. I have no recollection because I was living in Texas. Or people will ask me about things that are generally related to broadcasting, but not related to broadcasting. So um, somebody might call and ask me about PR, which is kind of, we kind of all work in the same realm, but it's not the same. So I could either say, nope, sorry, I can't help you. or I could define my area of expertise. So if somebody asks me about, let's say, PR, I would say, you know what? I have worked with some of those people before. You know, I've had conversations, but my, you know, my real forte is anything having to do with journalism and broadcasting and interviews and sideline reporting. What I'm doing is making sure people know that I can't give them any information about the first subject they asked about. Here's where I feel comfortable. Here's the space I feel comfortable talking in. If you want to talk to me about anything in this space, we are good to go. If you want to keep talking to me about that, you are not going to hear a peep from me, right? And then it's kind of on them. This works all the time. So uh, if you're not a Seahawks fan, so Katie, let me just throw, sorry, Katie. <laughs> Katie, uh, any, like, did you ever do, like, intramurals or any, if you run, do you, do you watch? <laughs> you play what? OK, perfect, <clears throat> right? So Katie played bassoon. I'm just saying this, I'm, file this away. Information, right? File this away. So Katie says, uh, you know what? I actually is not very into sports. I really like music. Perfect. Or I played the bassoon, whatever it is, right? Or you know what? I don't like listening to live bands, but what I really like is going to the symphony. Well, that's good. We can define your area of expertise within one group and within one genre, right? That works really well. Because you're sending a message to me, I'm sending a message to you, and the conversations can keep going. 
I could keep going and I could keep giving you examples. I want to leave time for questions, but here's the other thing I want to leave you with. Here's the bottom line. Communication solves problems in business. There is no question, right? But the most effective communication comes when there is a relationship that is in place. Because talking at somebody is not nearly as effective as problem solving and talking with somebody. And you don't have to have a 15-year relationship. You don't have to have worked with the same people for a long time. You can do this in two minutes a day. You can do this just by being around people without saying anything. Right? So don't discount the one-on-one -on -one conversations. And don't discount how far this will take you in your business, in addition to everything else you're learning in the class.